Hey, everybody. Welcome to Breakfast Club uh, and to the Ichthyology Collections at the California Academy of Sciences. This is a uh, four out of four shark theme programs. And um, we are here with collections manager Dave Catania, who is graciously modeling one of my favorite shirts, honestly, in honor of the day. <laughs> Hi, Dave. Hi. <laughs> and Dave is, I have to say, probably, I mean, this is going to get me in trouble, but like you are, I don't want, I shouldn't say the most popular just out of respect for everybody else, but you're, you're a perennially popular breakfast club guest. And we're so glad to be back with you in the basement of the Academy, which is where all the best stuff happens anyways. So hi, thank you. <laughs> um, I wonder if you'd get us started by just giving folks who've never kind of been in the scientific collections before, much less this specific one, um, kind of an introduction to just what you what you care for there. Well, um, I take care of the ichthyology collection. It's a research collection of preserved fishes from all over the world, going back as far as 1827 is our oldest specimen up up to ones we're collecting, you know, right now. Well, maybe not right now during the pandemic. In fact, we were all set to go on a expedition to the Maldives about a week after everything shut down. So hopefully that'll happen. Uh, That's right. This fall, but we'll keep our fingers crossed. But yeah, yeah we, um, we're actively collecting as as well. So the collection is. Um, fairly broad in scope, marine, fresh water, uh, and uh, we have geographic strengths. Um, we're, of course, just from where we're located, Western United States, Eastern Pacific, um, but also we're very good in tropical Indo-Pacific marine fishes, um, near tropical freshwater fishes. Um, nobody's actually doing any active research at the Academy on that group at this point, but that collection is a, is a wonderful historic archive because most of it was collected in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It's amazing. Yeah, it's that's amazing. Wonderful snapshot of what was in a lot of these river systems prior to a lot of deforestation and other yeah. habitat alteration. Yeah. And that's a, a wonderful thing about these these collections. They, they are, it's a history and it, it, uh, there's a lot of information to be had. Uh, in these bottles um, of specimens. Right. She has about 230,000 bottles. <laughs> um, but ichthyology is just one of um, many research collections at the Academy covering the whole range of natural history disciplines. Uh, yeah. So every collection has a collection manager and uh, it's essentially the librarian. Uh, right. That's a way how these function, these collections. Right. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, we are lucky enough. I think we've been we've been we've been in the collections with you for tours uh, a couple of times before, including for some night school events. But today we are kind of theming this one a little differently, uh, kind of in honor of Shark Week, because even though Shark Week is done, we're not really done with Shark Week. So this is our last program. Um, but we I expanded it to a last more box. Did I say that right? Last, yeah, that's right. Yeah, last uh, Just to give you a little bit of leeway. So. Um, <laughs> I think you've pulled some um, amazing stuff to show us today, and I will just say before asking you to to start to go ahead and 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 take us in that um, viewers, if you would like to ask questions at any time about anything that you see or anything that Dave says, you can go ahead and do that live. Just put them in the Facebook comments uh, if you're watching on that platform, or the chat box if you're watching on YouTube, and I will pass those on to Dave. Um, so yeah, let's get going. I'm excited, and we have our our specimen cam in action for some close ups when we get there. Sounds good. I think we're ready. Um, I, so it's uh, the focus is on sharks and Shark Week. Um, also, I mean, we have a, a new exhibit that's recently opened um, devoted to sharks. So this is all tied together. And I'm just going to stick with with sharks. Uh, oh, awesome! Today and not really go into their relatives, the the rays and um, the chimeras and other um, cartilaginous fishes. Um, sharks and their relatives are cartilaginous fishes, and they have a, an internal skeleton that is very similar to bony fishes, but the degree of um, calcification is what kind of makes the difference, again, versus cartilage versus actual bone. Um, and so sharks are all cartilaginous. And what I'd really kind of like to do today is focus on kind of the diversity of sharks, um, dentition, um, reproductive uh, uh, 
habits and strategies are quite fascinating. And um, also size. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's very interesting. Everybody has the image of sharks as nasty predators. And um, most of the sharks, that's not really the case. And uh, actually, what was kind of funny is last night I caught a little bit of Stephen Colbert's show. And he was having fun with um, a statement made by some Australian ichthyologists uh, that uh, they wanted to rename shark attacks to shark interactions to try and get the violent aspect out of the lexicon there. And so I was chuckling to myself and wondering if there was anybody I knew, because I do know some folks. <laughs> but anyway, I don't He didn't mention names, but uh, he had some fun with that. But that's kind of like what we'd like to do is kind of demystify sharks. And right. when you get down to it, um, there are very few shark attacks. Yeah. Um, one of our research associates, um, a gentleman named Bob Lee, who was with um, Cal Fish and Game back when it was called Cal Fish and Game, um, for many years, he published a paper um, with, with, at a co-author and then revised it a few years later that did a thorough survey of shark attacks on the west coast of the United States. And there are very few deaths and very few unprovoked attacks. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of attacks where somebody's gone and poked at a shark and you know, what do you expect? Uh, but anyway, yeah. but I'm hoping to dispel some myths about the complete aggressiveness of sharks and there's a great video um i think on uh in the library of youtube videos um, with our curator Luis rocha and um he and and um Woodson are collecting one of his students at the time although he's a phd now they were collecting a specimen using their deep diving gear and a large shark went overhead just to kind of check them out and they were completely oblivious to the fact it was there <laughs> yeah some great footage but anyway i'll I, put that in the i'll put that in the um the comments for folks that want to watch it it's pretty great but anyway um to well let's look at size first um the largest fish is the whale shark um it's about 45 feet long you can attain that that length i mean this is it's much shorter than a than a than a blue whale um, but it is the largest fish. 45 feet, think Amazing. maybe an airport or bus. Um, the next largest fish is the basking shark. And the basking shark and the whale shark are both plankton feeders. Um, so actually, just for an example of some size, this is the vertebrae of a basking shark. Oh, wow. This and I'm not sure exactly where in the vertebral column this, this was. So it could be actually at an end where the vertebrae are smaller. Um, but uh, this kind of gives you a, just a big idea of the size difference. Dave, can you hold it a little closer to the camera? Just because it's- if I can get it under here. Okay, let me add this to the- The other side. Wow. Really amazing structure. Yeah. But that's a basking shark, the second largest fish. Um, and that basking shark, as I mentioned, they're plankton feeders. And I have some very distorted jaws here, but oh. they're folded over. But just look at the teeth in the camera here. Oh, wow. It's two of them when you compare that with those triangular serrated teeth of a white shark. Um, these things are, um, they're, they're just uh, little nubs. <laughs> yeah. And do they kind of, do they kind of conveyor belts in terms of how they grow in and out? Um, good question, but I would imagine they, they do. But these, these um, the sharks, they, these guys don't, uh, they aren't chomping on things. So they're not likely to keep breaking them off. And, uh. Uh, unlike white sharks. So the other end of the spectrum, we have um, some smaller sharks. I don't have the world's smallest shark here, but this is probably about second largest. 
second smallest, I mean. This little guy is a pygmy ribbon tail. Oh, let me get it up there. This is this is full grown. Wow. This is full grown. They maybe get eight to nine inches long maximum. And where are these from or found? This particular one came from um, uh, Taiwan. Huh. But, uh, and this is a little male. You can tell by those two structures there, those paired structures. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are called claspers. And um, that's uh, the shark equivalent of a penis. Right. And it's got a pair of them. They're, um, they're modifications and outgrowths of the, um, the pelvic fins. And um, when these sharks copulate, that's how the sperm is transferred to the, to the female. Mm -hmm. So sharks are, I suppose, easier to visually sex than a lot of species. Yes, of they are. They have, mm -hmm. most of the elasma branches are. Even the rays will have very distinct um, claspers. So, yeah, as far as uh, um, being able to tell <laughs> males from females as right. far as which go, sharks are pretty easy. Yeah. And Dave Lauren S. asks, what does a shark this small actually feed on? There's, I mean, there's a whole range of prey sizes of, you know, in various invertebrates, maybe very tiny fish. Mm -hmm. um, the tiniest fish is maybe only eight millimeters long. Uh, wow! Yeah, full full maturity. So, um, as far as you know, fish and invertebrates, you've got a, a wide range of sizes that um, right can feed on. So your food chain can just get go size. like miniature, miniature, miniature <laughs> back up again, regardless of their size. Right. But, um, this little guy wouldn't scare you too much if you encountered it. Yeah, I think I'd be okay with that one. <laughs> um, since we touched a bit on, on, on reproduction, we might as well kind of go into that. Okay. Um, there are a lot of sharks that lay eggs, egg capsules. And um, I do have, let's see if I can get the camera over here. This is... It this sounds, Dave, like you're about to answer um, Betty's question, which was... The horn shark over here. Oops. Is that coming through at all? Yeah, it's a bit dark. Ah, okay. Is that any better? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Well. But if you bring it back to your main camera and just hold it, yeah, perfect. If you just hold it up to the lens, I think we'll be able to okay, see it. Well. This one is going to be a little tricky. Ah, okay. Oh my goodness, I see why. <laughs> a five gallon glass jar. I'm making so, it work. This anyway, time. Um, this, let me turn, turn it around here. This is a horn shark. This is a common one we get around. Let's find them in San Francisco Bay. Um, this is Heterodonus francisca. There are, there's another species mostly found down in Mexico, Heterodontus mexicanus, and they overlap in Southern California. Um, but these, these sharks lay eggs and the morphology of the eggs is, is interesting. Let me move them down here. <laughs> Now, this is an egg capsule from Heterodonus francisca, the one we have around here. And if you take a look at it here on the camera, it's got this spiral ornamentation on it. Oh, this yeah. is an, an empty egg case, one that uh, had an embryo in it. But um, you see that spiral on there. Mm -hmm. This is uh, kind of, this is the one Heterodontus francisca. And then the other species further south, uh, Mexicanus, has a, a different um, structure. There. Same sort of spiral um, ornamentation, but a bit different in appearance. There's this one for comparison. Mm -hmm. Edges is more that edge is more of a band rather than uh, a, um, a thin sheet like that. 
And there's one of our specimen tags. Right. What um, is the um, what's the advantage of being of an egg case being spiral shaped? Interestingly enough, um, sharks generally don't do much of any parental care. Mm -hmm. But uh, th this is kind of cited as an example of kind of a minimal bit of um, parental care. But uh, when these eggs are laid, um, they notice that the um, the female shark that lays the egg will actually use that almost like the threads on a screw and try and screw it into a crevice huh. by biting one end and then kind of spinning its body around oh, wow. to kind of wedge it in there to help protect it. Wow. So it, 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 I mean, it doesn't stick around and, and guard the, the eggs, but um, at least right at the start, it tries to make sure that it's uh, in a protected place. Um, that, so that behavior has been, has been observed in, uh, in these sharks. I had no idea, that's super interesting. Put, and there we, are, and Dave, there are sharks that give live birth as well. Is that ooh, right? Yeah, we're, we're getting there. There's oh, okay, good. There. There's a lot of different variations on that, actually. Yeah, um, good, good. I just wanted to ask Betty's question because she had a, had that good one early. Yeah, no, there are a lot of sharks that give live birth as well, and um, there's different ways that they do it. Um, in some cases, um, the shark will have an egg capsule like this that's completely self-contained, yolk inside, so the embryo's got everything it needs inside the egg, but then the eggs are retained inside the female. And then when they're ready, they hatch out, and then the female gives birth. So wow. the eggs still say as these self-contained units, but they're in the female where they're a bit more protected. Right. And there are... Um, Sharks that actually have just live embryos in the uterus. And there's a couple of different ways that goes as well. There are. I bet um, one of them's not good, huh? For, <laughs> for the other embryos. There, there, yes, that does happen, yeah. <laughs> um, but when you actually have the embryos not in an egg capsule, what you sometimes have is a species that have an actual placenta. I mean, histologically, oh. it's not the same as a mammalian placenta, but it serves the same purpose. Huh. And you have an umbilical cord. And um, so that's one way. And the other way is you have the embryos. And what the female does is ovulates excess eggs and unfertile eggs. And those become the food for the embryos. So yeah. the embryos are, are fed one way or another by the umbilical, by just what's in the egg itself, the yolk, or by these um uh, unfertilized eggs that the, the female ovulates. So there's different ways. And from the outside, all of those are, are live births. Right. And right. what does happen um, where the embryos are uh, not encapsulated is um, you can have, well, survival of the fittest. And the embryos will actually attack and eat each other. Mm -hmm. All that intrauterine cannibalism. <laughs> right. And Very tidy. So at birth, they've already been tested and are the survivors of that initial situation. Right. Um, so, yeah, and uh, mating is usually an, an interesting thing. It, there, you can frequently see females with bite marks where the male will, you know, hold on yeah. um, while they're copulating. So, um yeah, so shark reproduction is quite interesting. Yeah. And it kind of covers a, a wide a wide range. Totally. Yeah, a wide range of strategies. I think we did actually see photos, maybe in an earlier talk Louise did, but of um, female sharks with bite marks on their kind of shoulder yeah. area almost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the male yeah. kind of attached or really by a fin, face of a fin. Yeah. Uh, and just to kind of hold them together. Yeah, I beg your pardon, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Don't approve. Um, Fantastic. And these are some really good questions coming in. Um, Olivia had a very specific one that I'm also going to probably mispronounce. Uh, sh uh, they were curious, do you have any collections of the fluid that is inside the ampoule of Lorenzi? Lorenzini. Of Lorenzini. Thank you. Uh, no, that we just preserve the whole specimens. Mm -hmm. And um, our protocol now, what we'll do is we'll take tissue samples, usually a fin clip, and put that directly in 95% ethanol for later storage in an ultra-cold freezer or in a liquid nitrogen bath. 
but we don't get down to a lot of more physiological aspects. Um, so uh, we, my guess is that might not really be that interesting after it's been in formalin and then alcohol. Right, right. Um, but that's just, um, that's the sort of thing we don't generally do as part of our process. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's something you'd probably need to have a, a living specimen for. Um, that sort of research could maybe take place with the proper protocols and, you know, in a, in a facility, you know, that had live animals, Fleming Steinhardt Aquarium. You know, right. You know, that sort of thing. Right. Um, the way of Lorenzini are electroreceptors. Mm -hmm. You look on like the snout of a shark, you see all these little pores, and those are very sensitive to minute electrical currents and um, generated by, for example, the heartbeat of a flatfish buried in sand. Um, a, a shark can use those that sensory modality to home in on those things. Um, and that actually kind of reminds me of an uh, of incident that happened in the old academy, the Steinhardt Aquarium had this large fish roundabout. And mm -hmm. you go up a spiral staircase into the center of it, and the fish, these oceanic fishes, would be swimming around you. Um, and uh, one time they got a, uh, a fisherman called a white shark, and um, they put her in the tank. And um, she was there on display for about two weeks, I think, before they tagged her, put a radio tag on her, and released her out at the Farallons. Um, but at one point, she was banging her head into the wall. And it turns out what had happened is there was some cracks in the concrete, and some of the salt water from the tank had leached in. And the, the corrosion that was happening between the salt water and the steel rebar, um, it wasn't epoxy coated. Uh, so that was creating a little electrical impulse that huh. uh, she was sensing. Um, another interesting thing about that is that was many years ago and uh, sharks weren't quite as, I don't know that they're really well regarded now, but they were even much less well regarded. Mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. And so for turning that quote man eater loose, um, uh, John McCosker got death threats. Oh, wow. Yeah. Was that in the 50s? Something like that? No, this is, that was, uh, it wasn't all that long ago, in the 80s, I guess. Oh, okay. 80s, 80s, you know. Got it. But still, okay. um, sharks were more, seen more as a nuisance as opposed to an essential piece sure. of the ecosystem um, and one that really needs to be protected. Yeah, I couldn't. I, I there's lots of people who remember the roundabout, but for some reason, I didn't know that it was still uh, still with us in the '80s. That's really that's a super interesting story. It really, was, yeah. I mean, it was in the old uh, building yeah. until the time we we tore okay. it down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we built this place. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, let's see. Where are we? What are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? Oh, let's see. What we've got I'm looking at different body types. An interesting one is the hammerhead. So wow. Here. This is a fairly common one, the scalloped hammerhead. Um, Spherina luini. And um, there, there's a, most of the, the hammerheads are in the genus Spherina. There's one um, in a genus Yusphira, where it's called the, the wing, wing head, and the, the cephalic um, uh, lobes here are much longer. They're way out, the comparable size, but they'd be way out here. And so that's the one with the largest um, cephalofoil, is there. Uh -huh. um, and then at the other extreme, you have the bonnet head um, that has much shorter ones very much shorter and um, the putting the nostrils and the eyes that far apart um, helps uh, uh, sensing helps when actually you know visual acuity and uh, being able to home in on scent uh, chemical sense in the right. water can you can you scooch that one just a little further under the camera there oh neat 
Yeah, we had a um, we had a scal. What, what was this one? The second species you said, scaloped. Oh, this is the um, scalloped amaranth. That's a scalloped. And what's the other? What was the other species you mentioned? I think it's called uh, with the much shorter sepal. Oh, the bonnet. It was called the bonnet head. Okay. Okay. Yes, we had a bonnet head expert on yesterday. Oh, ah, okay. Uh, very cool. Yeah. But um, yeah, hammerheads are quite interesting. They really are, yeah. And again, you can tell this one is a male. The claspers are there. Mm -hmm. This one was collected, let's see. Get the label out here. This was also from Taiwan. And it was identified by a gentleman um, named Leonard Campagno, who was a uh, got his PhD at Stanford University, and uh, was one of the foremost shark experts uh, on the planet. <laughs> so cool! I love that those uh, that our collection tags are as much about human history as they are about natural history or animal history. Looking at the old catalog ledgers is also quite fascinating. Yeah. They, they were all, I mean, when I started working here, we still hand wrote everything into the catalog ledgers and then typed the information with a manual typewriter on the label. Yeah. It first and then put it in the jar. And then, then the computers came along. And you, you were like, this is a fad. These will never last. <laughs> <laughs> What's next? What's next? Let's see. Oh, I, um, there was a different kind of egg capsule I forgot about. This one wasn't a spiral one. This is more of a, just a flat. Ah, yeah. I think this is what we had a question from Vanita who asked, are those black eggs I find on the beach really shark eggs? So maybe this answers her question. Yeah, some of these um, rays will do the same thing. Stand ah. Or uh, even um, even skates hmm. would have these uh, capsules more like this, and they're commonly called mermaids' purses. Uh -huh. And a lot of them will have these little tassels to help entangle them in in seaweed so that they don't just drift around. So you can see more right. of that yeah. at, at both ends. These particular ones are from. Um, a species, Apristurus brunius, or the brown smooth hound. And um, both these these eggs, and uh, actually the eggs I just showed you came from the Farallon Islands. Okay, right off our, right off our coast. Yeah, and then my hand gets wet and then it slips on the lid. <laughs> yes, occupational hazard. But we, we haven't had a dropped specimen on Breakfast Club yet, so. Yeah, yeah. Let's see if I can get this one out. This is uh, an adult of that species. Uh, I don't know if it's fully mature yet, but this is a, a brown smooth hound. And this one again is a male. Mm -hmm. Claspers. But this is this is found, this is caught off of um, San Francisco. So this is a local, a local species. This one uh, caught in 1962. <clears throat> it's been with us for a little while. Yeah. Neat. Yeah, let's see. Um, let's look at a few jaws. Okay. And uh, see what we got here. It's very exciting see, seeing like what you're gonna pull out of your hat next here. Here's one. Giant. Uh huh. What's that looking into there? Yeah. Let's see. Oh yeah, great. Neat. This is uh, these are a set of jaws from a short fin mako. Um, Isiurus oxyrhynchus. And um, the shortfin mako is one of the fastest fishes, if not the fastest. I think they, really? They can hit up to 45 miles an hour. Oh, wow. When we're talking in the water. That's pretty good. Yeah. 
tunas are pretty fast. They can hit around 40 or so. Um, so they're, they're all powerful. These are powerful swimmers. But this is, I, I believe, the, would claim the title of world's fastest fish. No kidding. And they, so they don't look like they're that big body length wise based on the Well, they, they get, this is a, a smaller, so ah. this is a smaller specimen. Okay. They mm -hmm. get larger, but they're, um, they're a very strong looking. They've got a nice robust <laughs> torpedo like shape and, and they can, they can really pack some power into that tail. Yeah. Those teeth look pretty serious too. Yeah. The teeth are, they're not serrated like a white shark, but they're awfully sharp. Even yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're not letting go if they, if they get you. Yeah, and you can see how the replacements are kind of lined up there. Oh, we're, you're just off camera a little bit with that guy. There we go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. kind of lined up. You can kind of see that a bit here. Same over here. Going all the way in. So let wow. me go. Actually, we'll see if this is lit well enough. Okay. Can you see these draws? We can. It's it's sideways, but we can see it. Oh, now it's upside down. There we go. There we go. That was exciting. Um, yeah. These are, these are jaws from a tiger shark. And let's kind of get a closer look at the Amazing. And then if you kind of, I'm, it's going to be a little disoriented here, but there you can see the um, rows, how the teeth um, are, the replacement teeth are all lined up in here. As these outer ones get damaged and, and break off, there's always new ones to replace them, uh, which is kind of a characteristic of sharks. That's amazing, yeah. And you see the difference. This, these teeth have some serrations on them, but you see the way it's arched over. So it's not quite, it's not symmetrical um, like a white shark. So uh -huh. the, um, the morphology of the teeth is often um, characteristic of species and uh, actually speaking of that got a here's for example this is a a page out of uh, <laughs> a field guide and you can see all of the varieties of um, teeth that uh, there are and how they're they can be very very specific um, to species yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So let's, um, I guess those teeth give you a lot of information about what it's what it's prefer what it prefers to eat and catch. Like and the tiger shark or the white shark. I've got one down here. I'll pull up in a minute. It's not our prettiest um, jaw, but uh, um, it'll it'll serve to to show the, the teeth. But this one's this one I've got here is um, quite interesting. It's a sleeper shark. Oh and um, somniosus pacificus, but the upper and lower jaws are very different. So let's kind of look at the specimen cam here. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna make that larger here. It kind of looks like a, the outer edge here, it looks almost like a bandsaw. <laughs> it really does. And then again, you see all of the layers going back into the jaw. And then on the other side, you've got teeth that look like this. They're more, they're a lot pointier, um, what you might think of as more conventional. Huh. Um, but what this shark will do is it will impale prey with these pointier teeth, and then it can move its upper jaw a bit sideways, and it uses these, this bandsaw type one to actually cut the prey into wow. the pieces that uh, it, can, it can handle. Wow, how big how big are the prey items? Um, again, it varies on the size yeah. of the shark. Um, this particular uh, sleeper shark was uh, almost fourteen feet long. <laughs> wow! Um, it but was, it still it still wanted to cut them into chunks, though. Yeah, it, it, I think because um, for something fourteen feet, this mouth isn't really huge. Right. So, uh, it can't like gulp a, a very large extremely large things down, but that's very that's interesting so cool. more falling. Let's pull out the white shark. Amazing. You've got lots of fans in the comments, Dave. There you go. <laughs> These are those nice serrated triangular teeth of a white shark. Wow. Again, you can see how 
ones at the outer edge when they get broken you've got replacement teeth ready to move in uh, those are some very intimidating backups <laughs> this particular specimen was 12 feet long and weighed 800 over 800 pounds Oof. it was uh, captured in 1959 Our wow. And so when you say when you say white shark, that's the same thing people think of when when they say great white, right? Great same white, species. white shark, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Australia, they call them pointers. Pointers? Yeah. <laughs> that's um, very casual. <laughs> uh, this might be just a little interesting bit, but um, our nicest, largest set of jaws is actually on display in the Steinhardt Aquarium. Mm -hmm. And... That one was captured in 1957 um, by a couple of gentlemen, a guy named Tomlinson and another guy named Jack Daniels, if you believe it. Very <laughs> small. Well, yeah, here's the, this is the, although there's too much reflection there. Oh, now we're upside down. There yeah. we go. <laughs> but that was a- uh, Oh yeah, yeah, we can see it. The fishing boat. Mm-hmm. These are the sort of things we have in our folders that uh, we, we collect information about specimens that we, uh, we get add to the collection. And this is, um, that's a shot of the shark itself on a, um, oh, wow. on a dock. Wow. It's, it's belly looks very, it looks very, maybe it's just the way it's lying, but quite large. Yeah, it was a uh, pretty good size. And of course, we have old uh, old newspaper clippings and stuff. Um, one thing I wanted to mention a bit is um, kind of conservation and how times have changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of folders in the collection going back to the 60s and into the 70s, um, Earl Harold, the former director of the Steinhardt Aquarium, would go to these what they called shark derbies. And the idea was just to see how many sharks you could catch. Um, so it was just a, a, a pretty bad just slaughter for yeah. no real no real purpose. But um, there was a folder of, with uh, and Earl Harrell would go to these shark derbies to collect data on, you know, the species composition right. and that sort of thing. Um, but it was still just kind of, a, kind of a weird way to, you know, to deal with it. And um, sharks themselves are just, they're slow growing. Um, they often have gestation times. Um, well, you know, a year, maybe more. And so yeah. they're still going, slow to reproduce. They don't produce a lot of young at a time. So they are very vulnerable to fishing pressure. Right. And so it's, it's, a, it's nice to see that we, we no longer do that anymore. Yeah. We'll, let me go out a moment. Um, somebody turned a couple lights off. On. Okay. I thought it got, I thought the mood lighting got a little intense in there. I'll just remind folks watching that you're welcome to, to ask Dave questions at any time. Just go ahead and write them down or in the comments or chat box. Mood, mood lighting, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see. Um, oh, as long as we're talking about conservation, um, the, we work in all of the departments at the academy. We work relatively closely with um, uh, fish and wildlife, and particularly the office in Burlingame. And their task is to check everything and monitor shipments and arrivals through SFO. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will occasionally see something that's being brought in illegally. Uh, and so a lot of times after they, if it involves wildlife, um, after the case has been processed, um, they will deposit things here. In some cases, we can actually help them with information um, as far as identifying things. 
Um, so we, we get a, a number of things, um, things that are CITES listed. That's the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. Um, that that uh, international convention kind of monitors um, how people exchange uh, uh, endangered animals. Right. Um, but in this one was, was interesting. This was brought in um, and this here, sorry, mm. reflections in the cellophane, but this looked suspicious to fish and wildlife and it was just listed as dried fish bone. And so um, what uh, fish and wildlife did was brought this to us to see if we could help identify what it was. And some tissue was taken from this and the CCG um, ran it, extracted DNA, and um, it was identified as an endangered species of shark. Mm -hmm. And they, they prosecuted, but this this was, um, uh, it was our, they asked us to help out. And, right. And it was, um, so we worked quite quite well with them. And so it's it's deposited here now. Right, uh, right. And, uh, and CCG is our, our uh, Center for our Comparative our, Genomics Lab, for those who don't know. Yeah. On site, it's, it's great. We've got the facilities to extract and sequence DNA on mm -hmm. the site, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. When I think back to the genetics class I took in college years ago. Right. <laughs> Hasn't um, changed at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was that, or can you tell what, was that the shark's fin or are you able to tell what part of the shark that was? Or? Yeah, it's one of the fins. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. which, I'm not sure which one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know one thing I forgot to mention um, back when we were talking about shark reproduction. Um, when uh, you've got an embryo, a shark embryo, and with a placental attachment, you have an umbilical cord. And in humans, um, when the umbilical cord is, is tied off. I mean, we have a belly button. And so sharks have their own equivalent. And I've got a couple of young here. And the, um, let's see. And usually the umbilical attachment comes in kind of between the pectoral fins. And so if you look on this embryo here, that little mark right there, mm -hmm. see, is it visible there? Kind of a dark, dark mark right by my finger. Oh yeah, wow. Um, can see it all that well. Let's try this one. It's a little more prominent there, I think. Uh huh. That is essentially the shark's belly button. <laughs> that kind of helps. A lot. I feel like people who are afraid of sharks just need to be told that they have belly buttons. It'll help a lot, I think. Not all of them, just the, just the ones that, okay. uh, yeah. that, um, that had a, a placental attachment. Neat. What's uh, next? Oh, well, I guess we might as well pull out the frill shark. Is that the finale, the grand finale? Um, I guess. <laughs> I it doesn't have to be. I think we've gone through most of the stuff. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to be. You just, you know how much I love that frill shark. Yeah. Let's, well, let's we toss a few, a few other little devices. Yeah. Let's do more. I don't want to rush us. Now pull some stuff out here. Oh, wow. A little girl. <laughs> nice color pattern. Absolutely. What was this species again? Um, this is um, Stegostoma. Stegostoma fascia. Mm. Can you scooch it a little, yeah, a little, tour, a little down in our view? Uh, I think it would be, your, yeah, that way and a little forward toward the rim of the... Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. It's so pretty. I just wanted to be able to see it better. That's yeah, great. Funny about moving the thing is it, it's moving in different directions than you're kind of used to. Yeah. And right. also it moves slowly. So there's a lag. 
<laughs> <laughs> so it, it kind of fun kind of moving around and not quite getting there it's because you kind of see what the what the what the shot is doing there. i know but you got it perfect this is great view Really amazing colorations. What it and it when it's um has it darkened in the formalin or is it? It has a it has a bit. It's um that's the the thing about all of the the fishes in the collection is they lose the colors that they have. Mm -hmm. um, so if if color is important or you think it's going to be important, you really need to document it. I mean, in the, when you had expeditions, you know, back in early 1900s, early 1800s on board a sailing vessel or something, you'd have an artist who would actually right. do, um, color paintings yeah. of, um, of specimens. And in fact, uh, Rebecca from our library did a breakfast club about a gentleman who worked at the academy, Toshio Asaida. Yeah. Beautiful watercolors. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so detailed and so so just they look almost like photographs. Yeah, and uh, but these days um, we'll we take photographs to document yeah. the color um, before it fades. Because yeah, all of the all of the specimens in the collection kind of have this brownish look. The only things that really persist are some of the real darker pigmented uh, stripes, bars, spots, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And just for another color pattern here. This is Prionase Glauca. Oh, tiny. That's the, this is a blue shark. That's the dorsal view and that's the ventral view. Hmm. So they've got a, there's a very distinct dividing line between the, the lighter ventral surface and the darker dorsal surface. This again, this is a small male. Mm -hmm. but, uh, is that coloration the same as with lots of other species where it kind of protects you from predators? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of classic counter shading. Mm -hmm. um, so that uh, regardless of which direction you're looking, um, the, uh, uh, they'll kind of blend in a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, I've got another one. This is speaking of counter shading. Uh, so for people that have, haven't thought, heard of that, I thought of it before. So if you're a predator looking up at this species, you'll see its white belly, which kind of blends in. Yeah. And if you're looking down, it'll be kind of dark and blend in with the, yeah. with the bottom there. It's pretty amazing. I'm taking that a little further, there are some sharks that are luminous. They have photophores and uh, this is one with a great scientific name. It's called Edmopterus lucifer. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, and these are called lantern sharks. There's a, a look at the head and the, and the mouth. But the ventral surface, although they're not really distinct, it has photophores along this ventral surface. Mm -hmm. um, and so it can, um, it puts out bioluminescence. And so that's another way that um, animals can do some counter shade. Yeah. Um, in fact, although it's not a shark, I will diverge for a moment. Um, there's a fish you find in, uh, in warmer waters called, uh, it's a whole group called pony fish. Mm -hmm. And they have a light organ that shines into their swim bladder. And the upper part of their swim bladder has a reflective compound, reflective substance. And so the light shines in, it's reflected downward by this swim bladder, um, the upper surface of the swim bladder. And then the musculature along the belly kind of diffuse it almost like fiber optics. Wow. And what the pony fish can do, because they're not real deep water fish, they live in, in shallower waters, is depending on the sunlight penetrating, um, you know, it could be early in the day, later in the day, um, or there could be clouds, it could be a cloudy day, or even bright sun. They can modify the light output to match the sunlight coming down. So cool. Or they can, um, it's, it's like, I guess you could call it adaptive counter shape because they can, they can do it on the fly. Yeah. That they can, they can 
obliterate their silhouette, you know, in changing circumstances, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. that's remarkable. I'm not a shark, so forget I said that. <laughs> okay. I don't think I can, but but I appreciate <laughs> your devotion to, the, to theme. <laughs> to the theme. <laughs> Fantastic. All these jars are it's better than better than yeah. birthdays or Christmas or anything. It's so cool to see what whatever's next. All right. So let's see. Maybe I can have your help with this if you want to grab the camera. I think we'll play around with the frill shark a little bit here. All right. <laughs> Sounds good. Now, what's what's interesting about this particular specimen is that um, it was collected in the 1940s, and um, curator at the time was a guy named Bill Follett, and um, it is the first California record for this species. Hmm. So prior to this specimen, um, it was not known that this species existed in California. So this is, is a specimen that was the first record uh, for this particular species. It's a, it's a little bit um it's a little bit dark. I'm wondering if we can stage well, it a little differently or if Aria can shine her phone on it maybe. I don't know how many hands free hands everyone has. Oh. Is that a little better or not? I mean I mean it's better but it's still dark. Okay. I mean it kind of makes it more more dramatic but that's pretty incredible. Okay, it's we can see it. It's, we can definitely see it. Um, Chlamydosalacus and, and, and Guineus. It has the species name because it is so long and slender. It looks kind of eel-like. It does. And um, the accession folder has uh, has some newspaper clippings that refer to it as a sea serpent. Oh, um, when it was first discovered or, or found? Really, it was just when the, the that first specimen in California here. Right. But if you can take a look at these, these um, gill covers, they have this kind of ornate look to them. That's where the name frill and the frill shark came from. Amazing. Is that is that because it, does it need those, the gills are kind of like armored that way or heavier because it's, it works at deeper um, no, not really. It was just, I don't know, this is just the morphology of the gill cover. Okay. It just looked, it looked frilly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll stop trying to make smart smart guesses because they're not smart. The teeth, again, are, are interesting. So it's almost like tricuspid teeth. And again, yeah. it's got the replacements going down into the jaw. And these he actually even kind of come out and they're even on, on the outside of the jaw, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, what, is that helpful in some way, or what? Or what is that? Um, they feed on some invertebrates, and I think the morphology of the teeth is supposed to entangle them a little bit more. So. Okay. Can you um, can you hold it up in your regular camera just so you yeah, can? Kind of do it. <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> there we go. It's, if you stretch it out, it's taller. It's, I'm it's taller than I am. <laughs> I <see that>. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. It's an interesting specimen. It really is. And what year did you say it was? Um... It was from uh, the 1940s. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, 1948 specifically. Okay. And just off of uh, just off of the Bay Area coast, you said? Yeah. Let's see. We've got folks asking, so I wanted to. Oh, hi, Mikhail. Um, uh, yeah, off Point Arguello. Okay. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's the diversity of sharks off the... actually a photograph of... The oh, let me put that up. Sorry, one sec. There we go. Oriented properly or not. But that's, uh, that's a see. black and white photograph of it. Might actually be easier to see than the specimen itself. No, both together are great. So when so when people first saw it, they thought it was a sea serpent, or that's yeah, that I, was kind of the idea. But then this is this is it all laid out. Kind of, oh wow! It is long and slender. Yeah. What a creature! Wow. 
very it's, interesting. You know, all these old newspaper clippings and stuff in here. <laughs> yeah. I always think of the library as having all of those, but of course you have all that in yeah. your, in we the actual. folders like that for a lot of the, yeah. um, the specimens and we acquire them. We open a folder and um, an actual physical folder. And in there we've got um, maybe field notes, uh, other information, correspondence about it, uh, collecting permits, all that kind of thing um, that, that goes into those, those folders. Yeah. And I, I lost the question here, so I apologize to the person who asked for not saying your name, but we had one person just um, want a little more info on how things are collected or how things come to the collections. Um, in a variety of ways. Um, one way that it was kind of talked about was fish and wildlife will um, give us stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and that not just from uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, giving us things that have been seized at the airport. Um, but also um, fishermen sometimes when they catch something unusual, mm -hmm. they will notify cow fish and wildlife and, and cow fish and wildlife will, will try and figure out what it is. Um, they'll maybe sometimes ask us to help and um, they'll frequently just um, deposit it in the collection here. So we do get material that way. Um, museums, we, we will exchange material with each other from time to time. Uh, Kind of trading some things that we've got a reasonable number of um, for something that um, we don't have you know it kind of it works both ways and so we can make some exchanges um, there are the theologists that routinely deposit material here for species they've described um, occasionally we are the repository for certain collections um, going back um, to the 1980s the Academy had an agreement with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, it was a baseline survey up in the Gulf of Alaska. And um, it was primarily invertebrates, but there were also fishes involved. Mm -hmm. and so we were the repository for that collection, that survey. And that got a, a flurry of activity when the Exxon Valdez um, spilled right. all the oil up there. Right. It was a baseline survey prior to um, granting any oil leases. That was kind of what it was intended for. Yeah. Um, and so we actually had to keep the collection physically together and after, until a certain amount of time expired. And then we actually split it up and the invertebrates went to IZ and got integrated into their collection. Mm -hmm. To the ecology collection. Yeah. And um, one of our research associates, um, Dave Greenfield, studies uh, Indo-Pacific marine fishes. Um, he had a, an NSF grant to um, do a thorough survey of Fiji, and we were the repository for that collection. Right, um, right. And we also, I mean, we collect things ourselves. We go on expeditions. Yeah, yeah. You've collected a fair number of, of things in there yourself, eh? I've actually even, um, uh, in a uh, previous collection manager in ornithology and mammalogy was surprised one day when he came across a study skin with my name on it. <laughs> I prepared it during a field study program down in Baja in 1974. Right. And he's like, wrong department, sir. Direction. He's going, wait a minute. <laughs> um, yeah. I've been in the field with you when you were collecting before and I would not get in your way. I'll tell you that. Yeah. In the various <laughs> ways we collect and it's, it's different depending on what you're, what you're collecting. Right. It started out at the academy in the 80s diving. Um, the dive program that back then was very simple. You just had to show you had a certification card and that was it. Um, and I ended up doing some expeditions down to Baja and then to um, Papua New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s and 2000s, I was doing all freshwater collecting in Southeast Asia. And um, the collecting methods are a lot different. Yeah. Um, and for freshwater stuff, we would use a variety of different ways. We would go to markets. We would stop uh, if we saw fishermen uh, fishing and see if um, we could purchase part of their catch. Yeah. Um, we would um, do various types of nets. Um, we would do electro fishing. Um, yeah. Sometimes we would use um, a plant root that stuns fish. Um, and it depends on, on what 
what's done locally and what's allowed and what isn't. Um, so that can vary from place to place. Yeah. So the methods are, are uh, can be quite quite varied. Right. Um, one of our curators um, studies deep sea fish. Mm -hmm. So his collecting method is to go out on research vessels doing deep trawls. We did a little of that in uh, 2011 uh, in the Philippine expedition we, did. we were on a mm -hmm. research vessel and did some deep trawls in the Verde Island Passage. Yeah. So set a depth record for the boat. The trawl went down to like 7,000 feet and uh, hauled, hauled uh, some specimens up. Yeah. So it, it varies quite a bit. Right. Yeah. And, uh, Amazing. Yeah. Um, did you are you are you holding anything back or was that our frill shark finale? Um, I kind of I think I've gone through most of everything okay. I had actually. I mean, I can I can pull out things that aren't sharks. Oh, actually, here we'll do this. This isn't a shark, but you'll often find them together. Oh, okay, perfect. Great ending. This is a remora. And sometimes you'll see video of sharks swimming along and there'll be these other fish right adjacent to it or even stuck to it. And um, these are what are sometimes stuck to the sharks. And this disc here kind of looks like um, the bottom of a, of a deck shoe or something. Um, that is a uh, modified dorsal fin. And these are actually the fin rays and they can move kind of like a Venetian blind, and that helps with this fleshy edge that kind of helps create a suction. Um, they don't do any damage, so they're not parasites. And if you look at it from the side, you see the suction disc is up here, that's the dorsal fin, and there's the, there's the eyeball and the opening, and the mouth is right out here. Um, so this is the top of the head of this remora. And um, they will attach themselves there are some that prefer sharks. Others will prefer marine mammals. Um, but uh, the, this is a fish you'll frequently see attached or right with a shark as it's swimming along. If you're seeing videos of sharks and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. That's an incredible adaptation. This whole so this whole um, behind the scenes tour has been so good. Thank you again. I know it takes work to to pull all that stuff and line it up for us. I really appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thanks to everyone who's watching. I wanted to add before we go that um, today is the last day for a fundraiser that the Academy is running in support of sharks. And we're splitting all of the donations to that with our partner, Shark Stewards. So I'm going to drop a link yeah. right now in um, on both platforms. And if you, if you have a few dollars to give, that would be wonderful. Um, it supports shark science, mind-changing public exhibits to help change the, how people perceive sharks and also helps fund the fights we need to be involved in right now to save species and um, critical habitat. So thank you for anything you can give. Yeah. And um, Dave, thank you so much for, for putting a bow on our Shark Week uh, series of programs. Um, it's my pleasure. It's and wonderful. And put in a plug for Sea Stewards. Um, Dave McGuire is the founder of that. He's actually an associate of the academies. Yeah. So yes. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, viewers, thank you, Dave. Thanks, can't wait to have uh, have you on again. I'll give you like a three month break maybe and then come back at you. All right, All right. take care everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.